Welcome to SEPSA Talk. I am Evans Apia Kisi, the host of SEPSA Talk. SEPSA is Center for Better Society, Advocacy and Research Africa. SEPSA Africa is a non-profit organization that believes in a better society for all. We in SEPSA Africa believe that a better society begins with you and I. Hashtag. A better society begins with me. For more information, please log on to www.sepsaafrica.org. Please follow us on the various social media platforms YouTube, Sepsa Talk, Facebook at Sepsa Africa, Instagram, Sepsa Africa, and Twitter at Sepsa Africa. Like always, today we we'll bring you another interesting discussion on the topic corruption in Africa the missing paradigms and I can assure you that don't go away stay tuned you would get educated and you would be informed we are again live on Facebook we are streaming live on AK Menses war as well as Facebook at Sepsa Africa a background one of the major challenges to achieving a better society in Africa is corruption. Corruption can be referred to as practices such as bribery, facilitation payment, nepotism, and favoritism. In Africa, corruption can have different causes and consequences. The key aim of this episode of Sepsa Talk is to facilitate the interactions and reflections upon three issues. We look at major systemic and structural causes of corruption in Africa, consequences of corruption, major techniques that can be put forward to fight against corruption in Africa. This obviously is not your usual theoretical debate on corruption. It's about the real issues, the missing paradigms as far as corruption in Africa is concerned. And to help us deal with this important issue are Mr. Albert Kobina Mensa. He's the CEO of SEPSA Africa. He's currently a doctoral researcher at Ruha University, Bochum, Germany. He holds a Master of Science in Water Resources from Kenyatta University, Nairobi, Kenya. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Sciences from University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Mr. Albert Kobina Mensa, welcome once again to SEPSA Talk. Thank you very much, Evans, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Great. Our next guest is Mr. Lord Eduse Akins. He's also a regular panelist of uh, SEPSA Talk. He's a doctoral researcher at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. His research focus lies in international development policy and biosecurity. He holds a Master of Science from Stockholm University, Sweden, Master of Science from Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, Sweden, and a Bachelor of Science from KNUSD, Ghana. Mr. Lord Edusei Akins, welcome once again to SEPSA Talk. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to be on this show. Great. It's always a pleasure to host you, sir. And our last guest for today is, who is also not new to SEPSA Talk, is Mrs. Akosia Jima. She is a consultant in healthcare and human rights, researcher and a writer. She lives in Ontario, Canada. She holds Master of Social Work at Carleton University, Canada, MA in Human Geography and Resources Development at Western University, 
London, Canada. She also holds LLM in Diplomacy and International Law from the Lancaster University, England. And she holds a BA in Human and Resources Development at University of Ghana. Her expertise lies in international medicine, gerontology, substitute decisions in healthcare. Once again, welcome to SEFSA Talk, Mrs. Akusia Jima. Sorry, <laughs> I'm very happy to be back. I, I am happy to be with you all. Welcome everybody and nice to see you all back. Thank you very much. And it's always a pleasure to host you on the show as well. So, lady and gentlemen, welcome once again to SEPSA Talk. And today we have a very interesting discussion, which I said in the introduction already, it's a usual you know, debate on corruption. This is where we look at the missing paradigms, what, what the various structural and systemic causes of corruption in, in Africa. And we'll begin straight away with a discussion. And I would like to begin with you, Mr. Albert Kobina Mensa. And this is it. Well, we know corruption. We've defined what corruption is. And we do believe that there are different definitions of, of corruption. But the question we ask you is, what, what are some of the causes? Why do you think we are where we are, especially in Africa, without necessarily assuming that corruption is not a problem in, in the global north? This is not the case. But why are we where we are? Because when you look at most of the rankings, corruption it seems to be very high in, in Africa. Where are we where we are at the moment, Mr. Mensah? Thank you very much, Evans. And thank you once again, all the panelists and um, Evans for yourself and uh, it's a pleasure being, uh, being here today and thank you to all the listeners um, listening to us from Facebook and on my page and on various other uh, uh, platforms. Uh, Evans, corruption, I must say, is not unique to, to Ghana. It's not unique to Africa. Society, all societies are corrupt. But then we can put in place systems to minimize the, the negative consequences to, for us to build a better society for ourselves. Permit me to use a case from Ghana. I'm a Ghanaian and I'm, I'm a passionate Ghanaian and I love Ghana and I want Ghana to do well. And I mean well for the people. Permit me to, uh, to, to, to make a case study from, from Ghana. In Ghana, for instance, many reforms and uh, offices and regulations have been put in place by various governments in the past to arrest corruption over the years. We talk of the Serious Fraud Office, which was established in 1993, the SFO. We talk of the Economic and Organized Crime Office in 2010. We talk of, of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan in 2014. We talk of institutions like the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, which is the SHRAD. We talk of the Auditor General Office or the Department. We talk of the, the Public Procurement Authority Act 2003. We talk of the Judiciary and the recent one created, which is the Office of Special Prosecution in 2017. Evans, despite all these measures put in place, corruption cases continue unabated. Permit me to show you a slide that chronicles the performance of, 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 of Ghana in terms of corruption. I will just, I will just be brief. Okay, so we have the slides now. I'll be brief. Um, just as we can see from this slide over here, this is the performance of Ghana in terms of corruption from 2010, from 2012 to 2019. Mm. In 2019, I will start from I will start from 2012 from the bottom up. In 2012, Ghana, Ghana, Ghana was 64 out of 198 countries in the world and we scored a mark of 45 percent now the mark the the lower the lower the uh, the, the worse okay and the the, the 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 higher the better and in 2013 we scored 46 percent 
2014, we scored 48 percent. We scored 47 uh, percent in 2015, 43 in 2016, 40 in 2017, and 41 in 2018, and 41 in 2019. So I, I stop sharing my screen so that I can go on. Okay, go ahead. So stop share. Very good. Just as we saw over there, realize that Ghana's performance in terms of corruption had been, had, had, had been decreasing over the years. Why is it that we have put in place all these measures, but, but corruption keeps occurring unabated? It is because the problem of corruption, which is systemic, had not been addressed. Corruption, there, there, are, there are inherent factors that we need to address. Evans, let's talk about our, our dishonesty, our culture of dishonesty as a society. We talk about we have been cheaters as people. We can blame it on our education, on our training, on our upbringing, and our mindset as people. Evans, permit me to say, that our training and upbringing in Ghana had taught us to steal. It has taught us to put, to put money first and it has taught us not to put humanity topmost priority. That is why you find parents buy examination materials for their wards to excel in an examination. That is the reason why school, school students could pay invigilators so that they could be allowed to cheat in examination. That is the reason why the police is standing on the road and taking bribe from, 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 from commercial drivers. That is the reason why chiefs and land surveyors are able to sell land to more than one person. Because we have, put, we have been taught to choose money first and to put humanity, uh, humanity second. So this, when you train up children like this, these children grow up and they become corrupt in institutions, in the universities, in mainstream politics, and in all their ways all true. And this should be checked our training, our upbringing, and our mindset of not putting humanity topmost priority and by choosing money as topmost priority. Evans, I will not talk long. Permit me to add another inherent factor that, has, that had also el el eluded us and we have not been able to talk about in, in, our, in tackling corruption. We talk about what is called the culture of, patron uh, culture of patronage networks. Now, what do I mean by the culture of patronage networks? Patronage networks are where politicians become parents and guardians for communities. Okay, you find MP, MP is, is, is paying school fees of, 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 of people in his constituency. You, have, you find an MP becoming, I mean, sponsoring weddings, sponsoring funerals, and also in churches they are taking to, 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 as chairman of, 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 of many events. Okay, and you find um, for politicians and MPs also interceding, also finding jobs for people and also interceding in terms of seeing headmasters, seeing big men in the society for, for, for wars in their constituency. Mm -hmm. These are breeding grounds for corruption, which we must also take a critical look at. These are paradigms that have not been addressed and as time goes on, we'll be able to talk about the other things that need to be taken seriously and be rooted out from our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. Just a quick follow up. So you mentioned more of systemic causes, one being the culture of dishonesty, and then the other one, again, if you can help me, culture of what? Pat patronage networks. Patronage networks. So, but if you could help us to understand that, I mean, how does that amount to corruption? I don't think it's wrong if, if I'm a politician or, you know, I'm a well-to-do person and I carry out my, my duty, you know, I go to funerals or weddings and I give out something. I mean, because we all believe in the act of philanthropy. So how does that amount to corruption? If you could break it down a little bit, this was not so clear, I would say. Thank you very much, Evans. Evans, MPs, politicians in societies, in our constituencies are not parents for anyone. They are there to represent the greater good or the greater interest of the society or the part, that particular constituency. You are not, so when people uh, run to politicians, 
okay, in terms of, I mean, trying to ask them for, for school fees and other things, okay, such, it becomes a breaking ground for corruption in the sense that such person or such particular MP is bound to make more money in order to be able to uh, take care of these side things. Because, mind you, this MP comes to pay and this money, this money is paid. He cannot use his money to pay you. You understand? So it, 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 it becomes breeding ground because he's forced to look for more sources of income to be able to satisfy his constituency. What we can do is that, you know, we, we need to, we need, we need to um, educate the masses in, in, in our constituencies, in our mm. communities. Okay. So people I think we, we will get there when we get to the second round, you know, how, what we can put in place to address some of these things. But point well made, I think it's clear and, now. If, if, I can, if I can end by saying that, okay, every child has parent and every child is a responsibility of the greater, or is, or, 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 of the society, okay? Every child is the responsibility of government to take care of. It is not the responsibility of an MP to, 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 to take care of any child or, or to pay school fees to intercede on behalf of someone to get jobs because now when the MP is going to intercede on someone to get a job, it is not because that particular person merits that position that is supposed to get. Okay, he's going to get that position because an MP interceded on his or her behalf. But then people should not be chosen based on based on their connections they have. People should be chosen for jobs and people should get what it what merits them because they qualify. Thank you. Okay, so a level playing field should be, should, 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 be, should be made for everyone and not to not to get any kind of connection on which become breeding grounds for uh, for MPs to also to steal resources um, from our coffers. Thank you very much. Um, some of the things you said, I must say, are a bit controversial and debatable, but we'll come to that. Let me, before I come to you, Mrs. Jima, I would like to give Lord a minute or two on what Albert said, in particular, the culture of uh, patronage networks. Am I right? Culture of yeah. patronage networks. Because I, I thought that, and I would ask your view too on that, Mrs. Jima, because I thought that networking is good, you know, and so I don't see why if I reach out to a big man in the society that can you please help me to get this job or get this contract? I don't see how that amounts to corruption. But what's your take on that? Some of the systemic causes that Albert has raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, Albert has done justice to some of the questions that you put to him. And um, for a patronage system, uh, what that we're trying to say is that a politician in power will rule for himself and also for his friends. He will give contract to his friends so that he will continue to sustain himself in power. By continuing to supply his friends with access to economic and social goods, which must actually go to the people, he is trying to undermine the country itself. So when we say patronage system, we are talking about a situation whereby the government in power or the politicians create a, an environment whereby they distribute, they distribute um, national resources to themselves. This one that they do usually is about trying to maintain oneself in power. When I do that, you will also support me whatever I do. So most of the things that the politicians or the president, let's take for instance, um, when this gentleman was in power, when Mobutu was in power, he created a patronage system. That system allowed him to give contract to his cronies. By giving the contract to his cronies, they also never questioned his authority. Mm. From, from Mobutu to his cronies, and then these cronies will also do the same thing to their friends. So their friends will also never, will never question their power and authority. Because for instance, if I am the minister of say transport, I will distribute the resources that are in my ministry to my friends. 
and then my friends will also distribute what they have with their friends. This is what is called a patronage network, mm. where friends and friends and friends and politicians and families become a cabal that they distribute state resources to themselves. And then they fail the state by not distributing these resources to the bigger population. Mm. Countries that continue to do that are always facing economic, social, and political crisis. We'll, we'll, come, to, we'll, we'll come to the consequences. Sorry to interrupt, but thank you very much. I think you've brought more light to what Albert said. As far as the culture of patronage networks is concerned, it's much clearer, I would say. So I come to you, Mrs. Jima, and um, I'll give you a minute or two to touch on what Albert said. Again, it's still in particular the culture of patronage networks, even though I have to admit that Lord has done justice to it. And then you would also, if you don't mind, the same question that I put to Albert, what do you think are some of the causes of corruption? Perhaps if you could move into the direction of structural causes, but in addition to systemic causes, this would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, too. And I think that uh, both of them have um, addressed many of those issues, but the two questions you've given me are also linked because um, I see that kind of thing as a conflict of interest. Uh, it could constitute conflict of interest because um, it is uh, extremely difficult to when you do somebody a favor for them to it's almost like a family member getting a reference from a family member and that's part of the reason when you're getting a reference for example you are asked to get it from somebody else oftentimes other than family and friends because uh, the assumption is family and friends are not going to be as objective <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> Sorry, pardon me, listeners. Um, what I do think is if somebody is, and I see that as, um, uh, uh, let me do a little bit of comparison just to answer that question. Um, when you do people a favor, here or here in Canada, for example, if you're working, any professional, you're not supposed to be accepting any gift beyond probably a card or $5 or two dollars something that is just an appreciation but that doesn't constitute big enough to sway what you would do because the moment you accept it you make you you make yourself vulnerable to that person because then sometimes maybe let's say they can't they came to you and then you handed a contract or you paid a million uh fifty thousand <laughs> at, at funeral and then because you did that next time if somebody came to your mom's funeral for example your politician and then they paid you five thousand whatever that is a huge amount next time if they competed with somebody else for a contract you're most likely to give it to the person who did you such a favor let's say you were in dire need of money for your mom's funeral the person who actually saved you from debt, you're going to be nicer to that person because it's almost like a reciprocity, right? So, so even though the person may not necessarily be asking for a favor back, but that could sway you at the expense of the rest of the people. So in that particular case, you're serving your personal needs as opposed to uh, the national needs. So it could constitute a national interest. And so I see it as a problem. As I mentioned, here in Canada, even uh, party supporters, I, I do a bit of, a fair bit of volunteering in political parties. Typically, when you're contributing, you have a, uh, like a disclaimer as to how much you may not contribute, right? So there's a set amount as to how much you may not contribute. There are rules as to what money you may not use to contribute. Mm. So there is a limit just so then you may not contribute so much to have an influence on the party, right? So, so, so back to uh, bringing it back to the other questions you were asking, you asked uh, that uh, what are the other courses? One of the uh, uh, courses of, uh, and then you also asked about structural and systemic issues, which are all linked. Structures uh, or systemic is what part of our systems contribute towards corruption. The structures are, some, what are some of the institutional arrangements? 
cultural arrangements, political arrangements that actually reinforce, fuel or perpetuate corruption. Um, quite frankly, I would say some of the systems uh, that uh, perpetuate corruption, and as you looked at it, even though uh, Albert had said that uh, each, every society is corrupt, um, I would put it this way. There is a potential for corruption to, to sort of uh, breed in every society. But one of the things to stop it are some of those mechanisms or institutional arrangements to prevent it. And uh, that is why when every country is doing democracy, there are certain things such as uh, uh, certain principles that go with it, such as transparency, accountability, mm. civil society, uh, media, like uh, active or a vibrant media, right? A, a robust private sector. One of the things with African countries are, uh, according to experts, when they started the democracy, many of the African countries, perhaps except South Africa, did not have some of the preconditions for a democracy to flourish. Um, so South Africa was the, um, was the only one that had, for example, and let me mention, let me just outline some of those um, conditions first, and then I'll tell you who had it and who didn't have it. Some of the conditions are, let's say, uh, 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 um, a strong economy is one of them. National identity, almost like a unified national identity, is one of them. So people are more inclined to be more aligned with the na national interests, national identity, as opposed to ethnic or religious identity. G stronger GDP or strong economy is one of them. A vibrant society, like strong media, is one of them. A vibrant private sector is one of those conditions. Okay, a number of wealthy people that have acquired their wealth independently or through private means. Therefore, they can be independent to criticize the government. They can also push because of the fact that they have a strong economy. They can actually force the government to change certain things because they hire many people, because they are influential. Um, in Africa, uh, one of their, uh, in the 1990s, when many of these countries adopted democracy, because I know uh, apart from um, Botswana and maybe um, probably that was it, or maybe Mauritius, many of the African countries from the 1980s were when there was a, uh, this wave of democratization in Africa. One thing that happened was besides South Africa, none of them had the economy that was required to start democracy. That is point number one. National identity, with the exception of Botswana, many of them were fractured uh, countries. So, so, so many of these things did not even uh, exist. So what has happened in Africa in terms of the institutional arrangement is because ma the majority of people hired are hired by the governments, they're very influenced by the governments because many of them are afraid to lose their jobs. So they've all, almost always become a puppet. Okay, the media, because as you know, the media has only been vibrant because African countries had coup d'etats and medias were suppressed under mil military rules. It is only after the 1990s, whereby we could see a liberal, uh, almost like a uh, liberalization of the media. So then now we see many radio stations and it is now, in fact, Ghana is just one of the few countries and perhaps South Africa and Mauritius, as well as maybe Botswana. The rest of them, their media is not as vibrant because if you go to Rwanda, I know a lot of Ghanaians praise Rwanda and what have you, but they're censored. You cannot even criticize the government that much. So, so many of these institutional arrangements, for example, a vibrant media to sort of point out what is, uh, oh, sorry. I need to charge it, computer. Sorry about that, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> it was gonna log me out. Uh, so, so some of the, um, uh, media, so, so, so essentially, the, the, these conditions that are supposed to hold the governments very accountable and keep them from corruption doesn't exist. Okay, so let me quickly 
talk about how these also perpetuate. So, so we don't have the conditions that will prevent. Mm. But then look at the other conditions that we also have. Because of, um, let's say, uh, the fractured ethnic, there's a lot of tribal, or I don't like using the word tribal because I think it has a racist connotation. Trouble, almost like primitive. So, so I don't like the word tribal. I would like to use ethnicity. Mm. So, so, so you could see that there's a lot of ethnic identity politics in, 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 in many of the African countries, and it's not unique in Ghana. As you see it, most of the political parties are structured along ethnic lines. One of the things that um, some of these countries, and that tie into what uh, Albert and uh, what um, Lord addressed is, Many of these political entrepreneurs, what they do is they inflame ethnic tensions in order to advance their political careers or political agenda. Therefore, what they do is they, they, they sort of, because as you know, because of their political boundaries that were drawn, many of their uh, different ethnic groups were essentially lumped into new African states and so everybody mostly identifies with their own ethnic group. So people are more loyal to their own ethnic group as opposed to the national interest. Because of that political uh, uh, entrepreneurs or political uh, entities, they capitalize on it, inflame their tensions between these ethnic groups just to advance their own political career. But one of the dangers of it is that also helped them to perpetuate corruption because they belong, as you see it in Ghana, their, their political, uh, their supporters of these political uh, uh, entrepreneurs, their own political figure can never go wrong. They defend the corruption or they sort of uh, uh, put a blind eye to what they do, their fears to what they do. However, they point to the other opponents. Mm. So, Yeah, it appears we are having some challenges with the network from Mrs. Jimmy's side, but we would continue the discussion and um, if we get her back, we would ask her a few follow-up questions. And so, but before she comes, I wanted to give you the opportunity, Albert, what's your take on that? One of the things I picked from her is the fact that, I wanted to ask her a follow-up question too, is the fact that because Africans lack the preconditions for a proper democracy, this is a major structural cause of corruption that we, we have. What, what's your take on that? You, you think that it's, it's really the case that because we are not able to practice democracy very well? Evans, thank you very much. I think democracy, for a system to be de democratic or to be described as democratic, there are characteristics that go with it. Okay, we talk about the free press, we talk about the free judiciary, we talk about vibrant um, civil society. Okay, and this, this, these are some characteristics. Okay, but mm. so when you see in a system, especially where the media, the, the content of what the media put out there is censored, then there's a problem. If you see where the content or, or where in, instead of the media becoming an orifice to propagate messages of, of building better society, become rather appendages of whereby, especially let's talk about Ghana for instance, where fetish priests sometimes are invited on the media to teach people how to make blood money. Mm. That is not the function of a media. Mm. The function of a media is to entertain, to educate and to inform. So you ask yourself, when such things happen, do they fall in line with the, these three main functions of a media? Then the other thing about the media, there are cases in Africa where the media is bought. The media is not able to ask the critical questions because they are afraid of the government in power. You know, mm. in Africa, many people are protective of their jobs. They are afraid of losing their jobs, so they are not able to speak truth to power. These are critical issues that should, should, should mm. be happening in, 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 a, in a democratic system. Mm. Okay. okay, to add on a few to what uh, Mrs. Dima said uh, about the structural causes of, um, of, 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 of corruption in our country or in many African countries. 
let's talk about many of these um, policies, many legal uh, frameworks. Please, please do that in a minute for me, please. Okay. So maybe my point I'm trying to make, maybe when Mrs. Jima finishes, let me, let me I'll, go. Come, I'll come back later. Exactly. This, this is fine for me as well. So welcome back, Mrs. Jima. We definitely understand the technical challenges. So yes, you were you know, highlighting so, some so of the structural causes. So go ahead. Sorry, thank you. And I, my apologies to our listeners. Um, I just didn't know what happened, but hopefully it doesn't happen again. Uh, thank you. Um, what I wanted to say was, uh, so, so the ethnic, ethnic identity politics, not only do the politicians use that, but it also helps them to sort of uh, um, almost like perpetuate a chronism or nepotism that uh, Lord and Aiken uh, and Albert talked about. Uh, essentially, what they do is then when they get power, then the people that are aligned with their, their personal views, they sort of surround themselves with it. Therefore, it's even difficult for them to, to criticize them. So it's like a favor, it's almost like a reciprocal effect. Uh, qu just quickly, besides ethnic identity and all the other things I said, some of the arrangements, are, um, I wouldn't repeat it, our cultural institutions also also promotes corruption. Um, uh, quite frankly, when I visit Ghana and I am doing something, everybody almost expects as if because I could give money, I should pay to get the service rendered mm. quickly. So, so for example, last year I went to a bank. I spent six hours in the bank. Uh, I, I, I was so frustrated and I didn't understand why you have your money and you have to waste time if this is a country that is wanting people to invest and you do that to somebody who has their money. How do you encourage somebody to put your money in the bank? You know, instead of people actually criticizing, about 90 plus of the people said, it's because people wanted you to pay and you, you, you were sort of, um, something just to translate it to the effect of, you have a strong perm or something. Like, you, 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 you're just too frugal. Like, I, I, I should have just dashed out money. Mm. So, so essentially, I couldn't read a code. So that's what people made me. So, so this is how corruption is normalized. Okay. For example, you want to go and, and, and say and hi you to- You want to end in a minute or two for me, please. Okay. So, so when you wanna, want to go and say hi to maybe another, like an elderly person, a chief or something, people will quickly whisper into your ears, oh, get something for the chief. So it's almost like it's so normal like is that we always have to get something in order for somebody to like us, in order for somebody to accept us. So that is part of it. The other part of it that is a huge thing, which is sort of all embodied in this, is uh, the institutional arrangement we have are weak. Because of that, they do not hold people accountable. Most of us have seen that the people that commit their grand theft grand corruption are never penalized so the institutions are not strong enough again it goes back to the people that are there are uh, either hired by government they're not strong enough or they're friends with government so they will not hold them accountable and so because of that they do that as we may come uh, to, to know this actually fuels corruption outside of the country in terms of flow of money from from africa to other countries and in Side. So these kinds of weak institutions help for corruption in terms of helping external actors, mm. that is foreign companies to get contracts, as well as internally, helping your friends internally and helping the connections outside to help them loot the government. So I would uh, essentially just leave it there. And yeah. these are the institutional arrangements, such as the judiciary, such as the police force, mm. such as the... the, 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 the shrug and all those other things that are supposed to hold the government accountable, prosecute the judiciary, they're all sort of almost either weak or compromised because of all these on the table deals that is going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Jima. So uh, just a quick follow up. You talked about, uh, I asked Albert the same question anyway, that you said because of the no preconditions for democracy to flourish very well in Africa, this is part of the reasons why corruption keeps rising. And you mentioned some of the conditions. One of them that caught my attention, which I would want you to clarify more, was with the cultural identity. And in particular, when you also brought in the case of the chief, 
is it a problem with the amount that is given to the chief that's a problem because this is also cultural i think that if you're visiting a chief and you send uh, maybe a bottle of schnapp this is part of our culture how does that cultural identity you know cause corruption if you could explain that a little bit in in a minute or two okay i'll do it uh briefly but i'll do it in two ways what i meant by the uh, culture uh, I, I first of all i said ethnic uh because i didn't want to use the tribal the word mm. tribe i don't like it because i think it connotes primitivity and i think that uh white people use it on africa only well, you don't go to europe and use uh tribal for people you use ethnicity because of that i hate that word so i said that uh, uh ethnic identities and what i meant was uh people try to sort of uh, structure political parties along ethnic lines and it's almost because of favoritism so so that person you, as you can see that person come from my area so i'm gonna vote for them that person even though so so because the person comes from my area the voter doesn't hold them accountable the person comes into power uh mm. brings a lot of the area people around him the, the ethnic group uh in in their party around him oftentimes you even see chiefs supporting the political figure from their area because that is their son that is our son from our land so instead of all these chiefs rallying behind our uh, uh, population to deal with it or uh, the, the corrupt politician as long as they're from uh, their area they will not talk about them it goes to the ordinary person and then it sort of works in both ways so the politician bribes or pays for funeral weddings for other persons in order to win that favor and get the vote to be there and then the person support them because they paid for their wedding and then they're from my area so even if they didn't have a direct benefit because they have a prestige that that area town boy uh, is a town man i uh, should say it uh, mm. is, is the president so they're just essentially proud of it regardless of their record the other way just to clarify the chief issue is people extend it right because these days you, as you can see it, the culture part of it, like traditions are okay, but you could see that it's been corrupted okay. because right now, if you even wanted to give the chief, okay, it's nice tradition that I give you a snap, but now it's almost like a demand and they do it in weddings. They do it, and then now they may even demand an iPad. They may even demand a cell phone. Or, 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 so now the culture part, they may talk about culture, but corruption ha happening under the disguise of culture. So our main culture thing it was more of a, a sign of respect, almost like a cultural um, uh, routine, like tradition. But now it is, it is not about that. The chief even expect cash from the politician. They mm. expect a vehicle from politician. So, uh, so they may uh, uh, pretend it's cultural, but it's been totally corrupted and it, it, it's got less to do about cultural tradition because now the motive is more financial, more of a personal gain, more of a looting, more than previously when that was our previous uh, what was that meant for was probably as a matter of custom, right? Mm. So that th those yeah. are the two ways I could address. All right, thank you, thank you very much. This is very clear now, and um, yeah. So, Albert, um, you wanted to add to some of the causes that has been highlighted by Mrs. Jima. Go ahead. Yes. Um. Yes. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jima. Had done um great with her submission. I would like to add a few for the reasons why the, the, structural, the structural reasons for the failure of many institutions that have been put in place to arrest corruption, specifically in Africa, and also more generally in Africa and specifically in Ghana. Most of these um, institutions and the legal framework that have been put in place are set at the national level. And most of them are not uh, mostly concentrated in Accra. Most of this, um, most often than not, most of these um, institutions are not even independent. Okay, because the bosses of such institutions, if you talk about the Shraj, talk about the SFO, the Yoko, talk about the Attorney General, talk about the Director General, the bosses in charge of such institutions are ones that were, that were appointed by the President. 
you know, so when it, when it is done so, it becomes difficult for you to prosecute officials from the particular government. Mm. Okay, and when you tend to impede, when you tend to um, go against the directives, like we saw, we have seen some of the practical, practical examples. I don't want to mention names. Okay, they see you as the odd one because you are not helping or you are going against the rules of, of your own government. But then I think that should not be the people should serve their nations because they have the integrity to serve their nation. And that we pay no allegiance to serving leaders. We pay allegiance to serving our nation. But most often than not, we have people who serve government. They serve president that appointed them rather than serving the nations which actually gave them food and made them grow. These are mm. things we should look at. Another critical issue is inadequate consultation and participation of indigenous and local people in the design of these policies and legislative instruments. Another thing is inadequate education and awareness creation of the content mm. of this policy instrument. Okay. okay, how many, if, if we go to a place like Takwa, go to a place like Christia, go to a place like Obwase, go to a place like Sujamai, you ask yourself, how many of our parents there know the content of what the strike is supposed to do? How many of them know the content of what the Yoko is supposed to do? The education should be intensified because not much awareness has been created to communicate to the indigenous the content of this legislative instrument. And to draw my conclusion, most of the content of this legislative instrument have been drawn from international protocols, treaties, and conventions. Okay, and the content have not been carved to suit our cultural needs or specificity. So I think that the content should be carved to suit and ad address our, 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 our cultural needs mm -hmm. because culture is, is, is society or society um, is specific to every society. So we cannot use the UN conventions against corruption and just apply it to Ghana. It applies at the national level, but certain sessions should also be carved to our, our, our situation. Mm, thank you very much. And um, thanks also for adding to the institutional or the weak institutional arrangements that we have that has caused um, corruption to yeah. be on the rise. I come yeah. to you, Lord, and um, before you, I wanted to ask you a main question on some of the consequences of, of corruption, knowing that you've written a few articles on, on, on that, but maybe a minute or two before your main question, also to touch on what has already been said, in particular, the structural causes as we've already had the weak institutional arrangements coupled or combined with the ethnicity makes citizens not able to hold public officials accountable as we've we've, we've had what what are some of the structural causes you think is, is affecting I, the fight against corruption I, I agree with some of the submissions that my colleagues made but i just want to make this strict statement Democracy as a form of government um, is not a corruption-free system. And therefore, when we are advocating it, we need to be very, very sure of what we're saying. Because if you go to America, the last, about a couple of weeks ago, we had, what we, we had a discussion on this platform in which we discussed about monetocracy which is uh, a part of the um, democratic system that we have been practicing. Therefore, democracy as a system um, has its own fault. Coming back to Africa, we have our own systems that we use to practice until colonization. So you, if you want to understand corruption in Africa very well, you need to understand the historical antecedents, the factors that have been imposed on Africa Formerly in Africa, it was diff there were communities that if your money, um, if if you if you left your money somewhere else, you go back and come back. You you come back and the money will still be there. Nobody will touch it. But because of the influence of foreign systems, I am not saying that the African system is 100% perfect. But if we look at Africa as a society, corruption wasn't too much part of our system until we had this, first of all, we, we had this encounter with Europe. When the Europeans came, they came as traders. By the time we became aware, they were trading in human beings. We were not trading in human beings. So we have to understand that. 
that system was imposed in Africa. When uh, this slavery ended, we came into colon col uh, the colonial system. That one was also about exploitation. There is no way you can express somebody without trying to manipulate him. And some of the system that they use to manipulate Africa is by using financial or other material means to target those at the top. So corruption, as, as, as we're discussing it right now, should be seen from so many angles. And that is where I want to come from. The, col the colonial slavery and all the systems that were imposed on Africa had a, as, as, as a, a component of it, corruption as a bigger component of it, that people were encouraged to do certain things that naturally they would not do. Parents were not selling their children. If you go to Africa, the, the, you can't find a history where parents were selling their children. But the contact with Europe brought that system into, in, in, into place. When you go to a place like Benin, Benin was a kingdom in Nigeria. That kingdom survived so many years. When Britain went there, they introduced this corruption. If you read some of the reports, that the British made, they said that uh, Benin was a city that there was no crime. Benin was a city that there were no uh, um, um, robbery. But then they had as part of this, the agenda to, to manipulate, in order to win the, the, or to capture the Benin kingdom, they, they, they had to bribe people. They had to do certain things. So what I'm trying to say is that corruption is though we had our own system that can contribute to corruption, where we have come from as a, as a country that, or a continent that was under colonialism, where so many things happened. And these things have continued over, over the years. And, and, and that is where I am coming from. Some of these systemic things that my friend Abed was talking about, or some of the issues that my, uh, uh, colleague Akushua was talking about, they were not already in Africa. They were brought in. And when something was, is imported and becomes part and parcel of the society, it is difficult to confront it. That is what I want to say so far as the systemic and structural issues are concerned. Mm. Um, coming back to the consequences, we know that corruption as a system has its own disadvantages. And if you come to Africa, it has done so much harm to the, to the African continent. 2011, there were revolutions in North Africa. Tunisia collapsed. Ab uh, Abedin Ben Ali of Tunisia had to flee to, um, to Saudi Arabia. The Egyptian government headed by Mubarak was forced out because of revolutions. If you trace each of these revolution, it has to do with corruption. Because that cor that gov those governments became so corrupt, they never bothered to take care of the interests of their own people. People got fed up with the system and they started marching to, the, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to Tahir Square, for instance, in Egypt. Uh, this very year, and uh, last year and this year, if you look at what went on in Sudan, they had to force uh, Omar al-Bashir out. It has to do with corruption. That government has been there uh, taking care of its own people. When I say its own people, the cronies, uh, what my friend Abed uh, called the patronage system. Al-Bashir was not taking care of their people. He was taking care of his, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the closest politicians and families and friends to the point that the people had no option but to go to the street. And we also know that power belongs to the people. Mm. So when people started going to the street, then the government became, um, started responding with violence. But you can, how many, how many more can you kill? And that is one thing. So corruption can lead to revolutions. And we have seen in North, North Africa, Corruption also can lead to state collapse. Nigeria as a country is a country 
that we can see, if you talk about Nigeria, 200 million people, that's fine. But Nigeria has nothing to show for, for itself. It is a state that is in a crisis. A crisis state is a state that cannot even uh, provide the minimum basic support to mm. its own citizens. So that is a crisis state. And if you go to Nigeria, it is a crisis state. It's a crisis, it's, it's a crisis a state that is almost, uh, almost collapsed. Boko Haram is in the north of the country competing with the federal government over space. That should tell you that when corruption becomes uh, the, the engine of the country, running the, the, every aspect of the country, it can also lead to terrorist um, um, activities taking place because people can then capture on or, or manipulate people based on the corrupt, corruption that is taking place in the country. So, um, South Africa, for instance, is called a captured state. A captured state is a state whereby the institutions are captured by friends. So if you go to South Africa, it has become the biggest country with the highest number of poor people. South Africa has a lot of resources, but who, who is benefiting from the resources? And that is why if you go to South Africa today, there are street gangs. Mm. People actually holding guns and killing one another. It has to do with corruption because these people have been left to the system. They have nowhere to go. So that is one aspect of corruption. Mm. It can lead to violence. It can cause uh, so much havoc in, in communities. Um, but another, an, an, another angle is when we look at economic security. Mm. Economic security is a situation whereby the country is able to produce for itself, um, supply the goods and services that the people need so that the country doesn't have to um, doesn't have to suffer from economic collapse when there's problems. If you look at 2007, 2008, 2009, Angola, Algeria, uh, Nigeria, all these oil producing countries, they started experiencing uh, depression, economic depression. What did they do with the billions and billions of oil that they were exporting? So the, the billions of oil that the billions of dollars of oil that they were exporting were going to some, some the accounts of some few individuals. Mm. And that also caused some of these countries to also experience deep depression, whereby the economy was not growing, unemployment was high, crime was going up, and it 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 it, it, it uh, collectively caused a lot of problems, for instance, in Algeria. So corruption has a serious consequence on economic growth. Absolutely. Economic performance. Mm -hmm. societal, uh, so, 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 societal growth. If you go to Ghana, for instance, there are communities that do not have toilet. This shouldn't be. But when you have the resources go, being channeled to a tiny percentage of the population, then the bigger society begins to suffer. Okay. And that is why if you go to Ghana and, and, and other countries like say Nigeria, South Africa, Tunisia, all these countries, they have problems, massive unemployment because the system doesn't work for the people, it works for a few. But one thing that we must also understand is that when you have so much corruption, it can also lead to civil wars. And from my, my, my studies as a security uh, uh, enthusiast, somebody who is involved in security, if you, want, if you ask any uh, security expert what causes civil war, he will mention two things, economics and politics. And economics has to do with the fact that people are deprived of economic means. See, uh, Laurent Kabila, in DRC said he can form a private army in a day with $10,000 and a, a, a mobile phone. Why? Because there are so many people in that country who are unemployed. Mm. So if I want to form a private army and I have $10,000, I 
I recruit about 1,000 of them, pay them $200 a month, give them guns, and I form a private enemy, and I can form my own militia, invade the country. So corruption, when it doesn't, uh, when a state doesn't take care of its own people, mm. it, it provides the avenue for unscrupulous politicians, unscrupulous individuals to exploit these loopholes and create havoc. And okay. that is why if you go to uh, DRC, for instance, it has the one, some of the world, world, the world best known resources, but the people are poor and the country is const, uh, in, in a constant uh, uh, state of war, of warfare because of corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord. And yes, you've well highlighted the various effects of corruption. I mean, economic, on economic development, you also talked about war and revolution and others. But before I allow Albert and Mrs. Jima a minute each, and be very straight on that, on to mention a few consequences before we move to the second round. You said something interesting, which I just wanted to follow up, bringing in the issue of slave trade and colonialism or colonization as being part of the causes. But what do you say to people who always argue that slave trade, as we know, ended more than 200 years ago, or colonialism also ended some 50 to 30 years ago. So we should, we should be able to, to you know, right the wrong. I mean, why should we blame corrupt practices on, 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 on slave trade or on colonialism? This is something that happened a long time ago. What's your take on that? Okay, I'm going to give one, one example. When the, uh, the, the British were in Ghana, for instance, land as we know it was not for profit. If you need a land, you just go to the chief. Chief, I need land. You say go and farm here or go and build your house there. You would need, there was no money paid. But when, when the British came, they said, no, this system is bad. You need to change it. So they, they commodified the land. And the, by introducing money to, 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 the, uh, to, to the land market, they created a system that has continued to today. If you go to Ga uh, Accra, Kumasi, and these big cities, you have land gas. Why was it that so many years ago, before colonialism, we didn't have land gas, but today we have land gas? It has to, you can only understand the origin of land gas when you look at colonialism, because our land system was not for sale. Okay. Land policy during those days were for, uh, were, were for need, not for profit. But when the British came with the colonial system saying that we needed to trade land, then it, the poor started suffering. People who, communal lands were, were, were sold by the chiefs to the point that now, if you are in Accra, you, you, you will have to police your land 24 hours. Yeah. If you have the parcel of it. it. This is the kind of system that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. it was, it was an, it, it's an important system. It's an important system that uh, has, has a, lot of, a lot of problems with it. Mm. And not only that, when we try to correct some of these things, you, it, it, it clashes with the, our own, our old system. Our old system is when you have the chiefs not selling the land, you going to the chief and saying, chief, I need land. And the chief will say, okay, a piece of land somewhere here. Now the chief has been told that he can get money. So a land that should be sold to you for say one pound, he will sell it for 10 pounds. Mm. And after two years, if you don't develop that land, the chief will go and sell that same land to another person. Absolutely. So, so sorry to cut you system. in, but thank you very much. I think the point is, is well made and yeah. I would allow Mrs. Jima just a minute to touch on some few consequences and then Albert also you have your take on that. Okay, thank you. And uh, I agree with law to a very large extent because of the colonial distortion of the institutions. And, and quite frankly, uh, uh, our democracy is built on many of these colonial laws 
uh, it didn't give recognition of the colonial legacy. So, so the distorted institutions are the same institutions that our democracy is imposed upon. So I'll leave it there for that. Um, um, in terms of uh, impact, Africa uh, actually is one of the African region is one of the fastest growing regions. However, 100 million people more today live in poverty than in the 1990s, right? Uh, the other part of it is $50 billion flow out of Africa each year. And that is even more than foreign aid combined, right? Africa is just one of those uh, regions whereby uh, people that are supposed to uphold the law and people that are elected are equally corrupt. And I'll, I'll give you a few things. And quite frankly, um, uh, if you look at the bottom 10 cor most corrupt countries consistently, at least five of them are from Africa, right? Uh, so, in 2018, seven out of the 10 bottom, seven out of 10 most corrupt were from Africa. There's a recent one, at least five of them, in Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Libya, uh, it goes on and on, Democratic Republic of Congo, so it, Burundi, so all these African countries are competing for the most corrupt consistently. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, in Africa, uh, I, I did just a little scan about many other countries. Africa is just one of those places where citizens have to pay for basic government services, such as even a birth certificate, getting a passport. People in Nigeria, people pay for justice. And many other, I mean, we all saw the documentary in recent years in Ghana too. So people pay to dodge the law. People pay in Ghana to, to avoid uh, penalties for traffic violations, right? Mm. So they pay to, to sort of undo, uh, 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 atone their sins, atone for their sins, so to speak. Um, if you go to Cameroon, people pay if they don't want to miss their, play, um, their, their train or they don't want to be late, they pay. If you go to the Gambia, people pay to have their children get the best schools because, uh, it, and regardless of what grades their children have, right? You go to um, uh, 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 um, Kenya, similar issue. So, so um, and I'll tell you a few things. In, in Equatorial Guinea, um, at least a third or so, at least a quarter, I believe, one, qu one quarter, like 25%, of children die before age one, okay? And the majority of the people that don't have drinking, clean drinking water. However, the vice president, who is the son of the president, who has been there many years, mm. has a fleet of Bugatti, okay? Has properties, uh, so has a, a fleet of Bugatti, Lamborghini, um, uh, other, other Bentleys, a collection of art worth billions, and then her owns property in California, Buenos Aires, um, Argentina, uh, owns property in London. And, and so with uh, Sudan, the Sudanese president, as of 2010, he had looted the country $9 billion. And you know where he sent it? He sent it to, to, to a London bank, right? And Sonia, 95, five years of rule, he hmm. stole between he stole between three and five billion dollars right so this is the magnitude of what we're looking at uh, and so africans are poorer corruption inhibits development it inhibits social advancement it inhibits uh, a political advancement as we all see and it's sort of it's almost like a domino effect so it recycles mm. itself mm -hmm. um uh, the u.s government uh, indicted an Israeli billionaire for, for some corrupt act they did in Democratic Republic of Congo. This billionaire paid about uh, 200, uh, $200 million to um, DRC public officials. Mm. And then... Um, you're ending on, on that note for me, please. I will. And so, uh, so for $200 million to the officials, and you know what the country lost in return? 1.36 billion dollars in mineral rights they wow. sold it 
right? So, so we can go and no, no. Italy was investigating another company. Spain was investigating for another company for some corrupt act in Angola and in another African country. So, so corruption costs billions per year, essentially costs more than we get in foreign aid. That is what we're doing. And they take the money and then invest it in foreign banks and invest in properties there. So mm. that is the other danger of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, for the sake of time, I'm afraid I would not allow Albert to have a take. Perhaps if we come to the second round, you could use part of your time to talk about some of the consequences. And before we get to the second round, we just have one comment here, which also is the foundation for, for the second round. And I must say that we are streaming live on Facebook. So if you are joining us, this is SEPSA talk and we are discussing the topic corruption in Africa, the missing paradigms. And my guests have been Albert Kobina Mensa, Lord, Mr. Lord Edusei, and Mrs. Akusio Jima. So a, um, a message or a comment from Maus Fosukwesi, he says that we are grateful for your submission. It's very important. We know what is going on elsewhere, also to help shape our system here. Corruption has since been the bane of this country. Then he goes on to say, please highlight the, please highlighting the causes. Let's not forget to indicate steps to keep this monster. And that's what we do in the second round. So in the second round, we want to look at what new paradigms can we put in place to empower individuals and institutions to fight against corruption in Africa. Because it's quite clear that beyond the systemic causes, there are also failure in our institutional arrangements. So the question I ask again is, what new paradigms can we put in place to empower individuals and institutions to fight against corruption in Africa? I would like to begin with you again, Mr. Albert Kobna-Mensa. Maybe you can use a minute or two 